I'm going to do a little intro. Um, Lexa, can you drop the agenda into the chat, please? Yep. Okie dokie. Everyone should have access to the agenda. If you do not, please request access. Um, today's call is going to be a little bit different than um, how we normally do our dev calls. We're going to still go over um, the past work we've done for the two weeks from Informal and Haifa, and then we'll go into our roadmap for 2024, have a discussion about that, and then as well as discuss a little bit about the funding proposal. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Johan, if you don't see any other folks in the in the waiting room. Yeah, I think we can get started. Um, should I share my screen? Yes, that'd be great. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so I guess first up, we can go over the uh the work of the uh of the past two weeks um so uh yeah marius you want to start on that yeah sure uh so yeah we we upgraded the gaia to be we upgraded the hub to the mainnet to gaia v12 uh september 13th the upgrade was uh fast relatively of course took a bit longer because there was a bunch of uh, migration needed for the lsm so it was around 25 minutes uh, and uh, the good part is that LSM is working. There is a very cool front end that uh, shows, uh, so I put a link there, that shows actually the a lot of the features of the LSM uh, module for LSM, uh, including the validator bond and also the increase in, um, you can see the increase in the overall uh, liquid staking. All right, so it's uh, doing uh, its uh, job, and we are so we are happy to see that no no problems there. Then the next uh, point is uh, Gaia v13. So last time we were discussing about this, we wanted to add cryptographic evocation to it. Uh, we we are still releasing, so basically we'll submit the proposal by end of week. Uh, we need to later talk more about uh, upgrading the testnet. Um, the thing is, we decided against putting cryptographic equivocation, so we'll delay it for the next release. The feature is already implemented. That's not a problem. The thing is we need to, we want to allow for more communications so that we can inform the validators on best practices when they are using their keys, right? So we realize that there is this unlikely event that the validator uses their own, the mainnet key on a testnet and the testnet has the same chain ID as the mainnet. And basically that's bad because that will mean that there is a chance of double signing if you do something like this. So it's not currently on the hub, something like this, but with the new implementation, at least this iteration that we want to, we wanted to release now, it could have been a very edge case where this would happen. So the best case to, the best way to avoid this, do not use your key that you use on the Cosmos app, do not use it anywhere else, or that you use on the consumer chain, do not use it anywhere else. Uh, very important. So we'll uh, use yeah. time to communicate, to improve this communication. Um, yeah, and I, I guess uh, I was gonna say like Sai and stuff, we should make a reminder for us to discuss this um, communication, but um, for before V14. Yeah, so ba basically it's possible, this could happen in theory, it could even happen now with the existing Cosmos SDK single chain case. But what changed is that with the consumer chain evidence, um, it's tricky to make it expire because um, you just don't have the stuff that's, um, you don't have the stuff, uh, uh, the same information um, if you're looking at evidence on a different chain. Um, and so because the fact the evidence doesn't expire, it just means that there's a bigger window for it to happen. So you could have been on, let's say there's a test net called Noble One, um, a few months ago, and maybe if if, the, if everything lines up right and someone's reusing their key that they use on the test net for Noble mainnet, if Noble becomes a consumer chain, then they could be slashed for double signing, even though they never even actually double signed a block. They just signed the same block height on what they were thinking of as two completely different chains that share the same chain ID. So it's like that could happen normally, but because the evidence expires pretty quickly, it just hasn't. 
Um, but we just want to be super safe. So we're going to do extra comms around it before, before it goes in production. Yeah. Um, also, what this release will have, besides the typical uh, bumps of dependency and stuff like this, we are updating ICS so we to, to this version, and you can find more the information in the release notes. But basically, it adds a governance proposal to decide for the community to decide what the norms should be consumer units in, right? So you, it, it's just a governance proposal. So of course, the state breaking requires a coordinated upgrade. So that will be V13. Also remove the dependency completely, the dependency to the liquidity module, right? So before in, I think V11, it was, we removed the state, we basically migrated the state. We kind of uh, use that force withdrawal to send the tokens to everybody to from the liquidity pool now we just get rid of the module completely um cool another thing is gaia with sdk is 47 so that should be gaia for v14 unless something weird happens uh the first part the first phase of the audit is done so thanks to op security and binary builders that they are help so the sdk team they are helping us with uh yeah, assisting with the results of the audit and stuff like that. So all of it will be made public at the end of the audit, clearly. Uh, LSM is also a requirement. We need, it needs to be ported to 0 0.7. And that's something that the inclusion and the strike team will do or they discuss with them. So I think uh, everything is good there. And we are also working on wrapping up uh, the guy integration. So it's uh, it, we are almost done. It's just some tiny things that we still need to be done. Um, then uh, the other uh, part of uh, the work is well, we are working currently on upgrading ICS to SDK 50. And this is also something that uh, I wanted to, uh, so it's something that we are, we're gonna do internally. And there is something that we wanted now to understand and to discuss uh, about this proposal and what's the purpose, uh, what, not a, pur a proposal, it's a PR, it's a draft PR. So it's a draft PR that means that we will not go over it, but uh, if the authors, so I think it's opened by, by Jacob. So if the authors want us to look over it, they have to give us more context on this. So we are already working on it. Okay, if it's not done, that's fine. There, there is no need to review it at this time. Um, basically, I was sort of specking out what it would look like to see if we can use that for composable. If you do your own version, that's totally fine. Um, it, it's like not a problem. And, and right now, it probably doesn't even compile. Okay, cool. Good to know. Just not. Oh, uh... uh, yeah. Matia, or I see Matia raise his hand. Yeah. With along those lines of actually uh, speaking out what needs to be done, I'm working on on an ADR for ICS, which will be out soon, so you could use that because we have we have it laid out what needs to be done and what breaks and what kind of sort that can be worked around and stuff like that. Sounds great. Um, and uh, the last point is uh, we are uh, the implementation for downtime throttling the the uh, the v2 of it it's done and yeah it will be added to a uh, interchain security release so that's uh, that's it on our side thanks maris i can go over all the test network um so on gaia upgrade tests we finished upgrading to v13 today um so both the testnets are now current currently running v13 which means that we are uh, ready for the upgrade proposal for v13 on the mainnet uh, imminently. Um, uh, uh, one of the byproducts of us doing this v13 uh, testnet work is that we added all the uh, testing scenarios for the cryptographic equivocation um, testing into our into our automated kind of testing workflows. Um, so this is already prepared for v14 which is when this feature is actually gonna be released. So we'll, we'll have that kind of ready for that. Um, the V13 test suite also includes um, all the checks for the two other things that are in 
P13, which is this uh, liquidity module removal and um, these uh, upgrades to the provider module. Um, and then uh, for B12, we, we did some testing for the LSM. Uh, Dante found a bug, which was later fixed by this, this ride team. Um, overall, we're feeling very good about the monthly release cadence um, that, that we have uh, currently for Gaia releases and feeling pretty good about upgrading the testnet monthly. I think all the validators are understand the drill now too, which is quite good. Um, we've been doing work on our test reporting. So we built this product called Microscope, which is just a, um, a page to do, um, a page to report on all the kind of testing that we're, uh, we're doing. Um, it's semi-automatic, so it basically pulls from like our automatic automated workflows and prepares a report for every release on exactly what tests have been done, what versions, uh, what Cosmo Visual versions we use, what what OS machines we used, uh, and so on. Um, we'll be continuing to iterate on this. This is all part of like an initiative to be more kind of accountable and public facing um, on the work we're doing. Um, on consumer chain support side, uh, we're still on schedule to do our test net for Noble on October 25th. Um, we've also been helping the composable team uh, prepare for their test net launch, and they will be launching their test net next week as part of next week's test net Wednesday, which is September 27th. Um, uh, another thing we've been doing is, I, I think, if you all might remember, I mentioned, I think two calls ago that there was an issue with the duality chain, which unintentionally got offboarded due to a stock VSC mature packet. Um, we've written some tooling to uh, detect stock VSC mature packets. So hopefully this is gonna be avoided uh, in the future. Uh, we're also continuing to work with Crypto Crew to help support consumer chain launches. And it's great to have him as part of the, the community and part of the team. That's it for my end, unless people have questions. Okay, no questions. Sounds good. Um, feel free to put stuff in the chat if there's anything that got lost from all of that. Uh, our next session is we're gonna talk about our shared roadmap from Haifa and Informal. That's been published um, on the Hub blog, and I've put a link in the agenda to uh, just the straight up roadmap with no uh, explanatory content, as well as our feedback form. So if you have feedback um, that you want to write down, if that's easier, feel free to use that form. That's probably the quickest way to give feedback. Uh, so I can pass it over to both Jahan and Udit to talk through our projected roadmap for 2024, remembering that this is open for feedback. So if you have opinions, uh, please put them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand and uh, talk about it. Um, <clears throat> should I go over it briefly, you think, or? Yeah, yeah, like a quick, right now. quick okay. through yeah, it, sure. thanks. So, um, yeah, so basically um, one of the, um, I guess we we have we have so so we I I, I just kind of separate this maybe into our ongoing our ongoing work that's a little bit more certain and then also more research and and development work. Um, so in terms of ongoing work, we are going to continue to uh, basically um, perfect interchain security. Um, there's a lot of things in interchain security where uh, we launched it in a state where you know it was basically um, uh, you know working, but there were things we wanted to change. Um, one of those things would of course like the uh, Cryptographic equivocation verification. Um, we finished that now, so that that feels really good. Um, that makes things a lot more solid. Um, but there's also other things. Um, there's uh, obviously the ongoing work of just maintaining it and stuff, um, keeping up with uh, SDK versions, and also maintaining multiple SDK versions at once. That's I know that's a big continuing chore that we always have um, because some you know consumer chains are different versions, hubs on different versions, that kind of thing. Um, another thing we want to do is there's there's some of these performance um, performance improvements. Um, so epochs and read only protocol um, are kind of things to read only protocol is getting rid of 
the kind of back and forth that happens between um, consumer provider chains, making it more one way. That should actually simplify the code a lot um, if we can get it to work and also unlock a lot of things um, like, per, you know, perhaps, um, you know, opt security, for example. Um, and um, also there's hub maintenance. That's like, you know, that's kind of like the stuff we've been talking about here in this call, mostly that we talk about on these calls is kind of, that's the, that's the day to day. Um, and so having this, um, you know, the, the collaboration, so example, the liquid staking module, which is now, you know, in production, that was an example where we uh, played a role coordinating a lot um, and um, reviewing a lot of code, suggesting changes, uh, even before it was in governance, suggesting changes to help it pass through governance and then um, reviewing the code, coordinating with the uh, SDK team and, and, and the teams that built the module to figure out who is going to maintain it long term and all that kind of stuff. Also, just the release schedule it takes it's a you know it's a lot of work to keep a regular release schedule going, but it's very healthy for a code base. Um, and then sort of just all of our upgrade, our deployments, our releases are usually very smooth, um, which is great. Um, but of course, we also are uh, on call to to handle issues during those. Um, and then also, if we have emergency upgrades like we have had once this year, um, that's another thing. Um, and then stuff like consumer chain launches um, and. Um, we're getting more to the R and D section here. Um, so one of the um, one of the things is is Atomic IBC, um, and that's that's uh, that's an idea for basically making it so that the um, <clears throat> so that consumer chains can can kind of have interactions between consumer chains that are instant and basically instant and synchronous. So it's like um, you could have a bunch of different things happen over IBC in a single block. And then also like if anything goes wrong, it's like the whole thing gets rolled back. And so you don't have to worry about recovering from weird states where your tokens are stuck on some one chain or another. Um, and so the idea there is make it so if you are a consumer chain, um, you have access, you can integrate with other consumer chains that much better. Um, so it's to kind of strengthen the concept of the AAZ, the Atom Economic Zone to where joining it not only gets you kind of like alignment with Atom and stuff, which has kind of been the case with a lot of consumer chains, they've been wanting to be aligned with Atom and, and stuff beyond just the security that's that's being offered. Um, but joining it with Atomic IBC, you also get this way better like UX and 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 faster way to communicate with those other chains. But you're still, of course, communicating over IBC with, um, you know, regular IBC with chains outside of it, but it provides this better interface. Uh, yeah, Syed? Right. So non-technical question on Atomic IBC. Yeah. Um, doesn't this effectively mean that the consumer chains just lose all sovereignty? Like they they're just subservient to the hub entirely. Um, yeah, and so this is part of obviously as this roadmap thing, it's been part of the feedback collecting that we've been doing. And so we've been talking a lot to Stride and Neutron, who are consumer chains right now, um, about how this would affect their operations. And I think the word sovereignty is kind of a obviously a very nebulous term, um, <laughs> and uh, but no, that is a concern they have for sure. Um, and this is it's stuff. This is stuff we're taking into into account as well. So, um, they're already using the validator set of the hub, yeah. Um, and that was something when we were working on interchain security last year and stuff was like, oh well, aren't you losing your sovereignty because you don't have your own validator set anymore? Um, and they found now it's not really a big deal for them, um, but. You know, uh, what you do with Atomic IBC where there may be compromises is if you wanted to use a different version of Comet or Tendermint, yeah. um, uh, that is, um, you know, that that obviously is not going to work. You can't, you you know, you're, you're sharing the blocks with the other with the other consumer chains. You're not like, like what happens basically the way it works is that like all of the blocks, like for every consumer chain basically get produced at once and put in one block. And from there, they figure out like what the IBC calls are going to be between them and stuff. Yeah. So um you're you're using one comment process so obviously there's no uh customization of your comment process you're sharing it with everyone else um there's two issues associated with that first of all it's like you can't have your own custom comment most people don't actually want to do that but they do want to use abci plus plus um which uh which which kind of lets them have which lets them get into the consensus cycle a little bit more a little bit more deeply than you usually can um and so one area of research that we'll need to do as we do this is to kind of see like um you know what 
what exactly is um what exactly is it that people are trying to do with ABCI plus plus and what are the ABCI plus plus function calls that could be broken by this yeah. or interfered with somehow um, and how to make sure that's not, not happening. And I, I'm relatively confident that we can probably make it work um, mostly the same, but it just needs more thought and research. And the one thing I will say is you may have to use ABCI plus plus a little bit differently if you're running an atomic IBC. And so how much of a problem that is, is something that I can't really answer. And we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to stage the research on this and kind of like to make sure that, that the compromise that are being made is, is something that's attractive to people and that, and that consumer chains will, will want to use this. Um, one thing that we have been doing a little research on already is kind of looking at the, um, looking at the UX improvements that it provides, and it should be a pretty great UX improvement. I mean, if you're doing a complicated thing across chains, we looked at Udit's uh, time wave um, stuff. And um, basically um, we found from there, it should be able to reduce the code. We were saying 90% Udit, maybe, I mean, maybe I don't want to be so optimistic, but like definitely by a lot, because you don't have to have so many different like ways to deal with like what happens if something goes wrong halfway through the process. Um, and then also, Right now, the time wave thing, it, it runs by, um, it runs, you know, has all these different IBC sends that happen and then each one has the delay involved for relaying. And so it takes a few minutes. Um, but of course, with Atomic IBC, you would be able to do all those IBC calls basically at once uh, or one after another very quickly. And so you, the whole thing would happen in one block. So the UX improvement is pretty good. We have to make sure that it does, that it does not compromise um, the, customizations that people want to do to consensus too much. And there's also another issue of resource contention. So right now, if a consumer chain has something going wrong and the mempool is just totally being clogged up, um, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's not going to, um, really like affect anybody else. I mean, it will affect validators. Maybe it will be some load on the systems, but it's not going to disrupt any other chains with, with atomic IBC. Um, it, it could be that it would like, um it, yeah it would affect other ones so there's other ways to do it of course like so there's like you could have separate comment processes but they're still synchronized there's even heterogeneous paxos which is something that no one's looking into where chains just from time to time share blocks um but all th those things are much more complicated than mega blocks um so we'll look into those as well but yeah we're we're still um researching this and we're also I think we'll also probably adjust the roadmap a little bit so that Atomic IBC is not kind of like the main thing. There's other things we're going to research as well. Um, so there's testing. Um, I'll probably let Udit take it from here a little bit more. Um, unless Philip, is Philip, Philip from our team in, in here right now? Go over comment muck. Or I can just do it if he's not. Um, so basically, um, comment mock is, uh, this is something our team is doing. So basically, we it's, it's like a fake comment and you plug it into your chain. So unit tests and everything are great, but also end-to-end -end tests are essential for any chain to really test it out for real. And so the slowest thing with end-to-end -end tests is that they have to wait about five or six seconds for each block. And so um, on a lot of projects I've worked on, you'll have end-to-end -end tests that take a long time to run, you know, um, up to half an hour maybe. And usually they don't, people don't let them get longer than that, but it's kind of like, you know, because that's at the point where you're like, okay, crap, we got to like stop running some of these tests. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of like, it can get very long. And so um, with Comet Mock, it makes it so that the blocks happen instantly and not after five or six seconds. Um, and so it make, takes the runtime way down um, in end-to-end -end tests, even tests, end-to-end -end tests. I'm talking about tests that literally spin up separate Gaia nodes. Um, those can run really, really fast. Like they like as fast, like sort of almost as fast as unit tests would. Um, the other thing it does also, which is a little bit more, uh, a little bit less of an obvious benefit, but is also really important, is it makes them deterministic. So um, they always run the same every time, which is great. Um, and then also you can control time and block production. So you can say, in my test, I want, I want two weeks to go by, you know, and you can have two weeks go by, you know, just like that. Um, and, or, you know, I want, I want to have a bunch of blocks. I want to have produce a bunch of blocks and it'll make a bunch of blocks really fast. And then, you know, you're a thousand blocks in the future. So that stuff has been um, really helpful for our tests and we're continuing to integrate it. And then also we're working with other teams to um, help other people use it. Uh, I think we've been working, I'm not completely up to date on that, but I think we've been, you know, talking with the Starship team and stuff. 
um, and figuring out how it can be uh, used by other teams to benefit them. Um, so yeah, Udi, you want to take it from here for the for the hypo stuff? Yeah. Um, so uh, over twenty twenty three, the main thing that hypo has done is basically matured the the testnet program for Cosmos Hub, um, and uh, they're both kind of technical improvements and operational improvements uh, that we've done. The main kind of operational improvement is that we've really kind of nailed down the process of having this sort of like release and launch cycle for new consumer chain launches. And so we have this uh, program called Testnet Wednesdays, which you all have probably heard me talk about during these calls, where every Wednesday we do a Testnet event. That's where we get all the validators to come by and do a consumer chain launch or new Cosmos Hub upgrade or whatnot. And um, uh, this sort of like regularity in the schedule has uh, really made it a lot more kind of like efficient and um, predictable for validators to participate in testing um, and overall just improve the confidence that we have around uh, releases going out. Um, so that's something we're going to continue doing, um, just maturing that that kind of like operational process that we have. Um, the on the technical side, we have uh, we have uh, automated a lot of the kind of like simulation work that we do um, for for upgrades. Um, and what I mean by that is basically for every upgrade that we do, we we autom automatically uh, export the Cosmos Hub state. We run a battery of tests, um, and this is the battery of tests is essentially a test suite that we keep adding to over time, uh, as in as in when new features are added or removed from Cosmos Hub. Um, so this battery of tests is going to be continue to be maintained. We'll add new stuff in twenty twenty four. Another thing we're going to try to do um, uh, on this front is add a little bit more on sort of chaos testing um, um, on in our automated uh, testing workflows. Um, and what I mean by that is right now we although we imitate the the state of the of Cosmos Hub, we don't we don't yet um, do a lot of the kind of like transaction modeling and have the same sort of like messages at the same volume as on the Cosmos Hub. And so that's that's an area of improvement that we kind of want to work on for 2024. Um, and uh, that's going to help us kind of identify the sort of like operational and scale related uh, vulnerabilities that that we per perhaps are not addressing as much currently. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the overall high level um, approach that we're taking for 2024. Obviously, since a lot of our work is more on the operational side, our day-to-day -day work really depends on exactly what the roadmap is going to be on the engineering side. So, for example, if Atomic IBC or the Megablocks architecture becomes a big focus on the engineering side, a lot of our kind of testing work is going to kind of mold to uh, to to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're open to being pretty adaptable for whatever comes down the engineering. Uh, uh, pike for next year. That's that's yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Happening. Oh, um, side. Sorry, lots of questions. Um, on 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 the testnet and specifically on consumer chain testnets, how does crypto crew fit in with your roadmap and your workflow? Yeah, that's a really good question. One, the main area that Crypto Crew is uh, kind of like fitting into the whole kind of workflow is we are not currently helping consumer chain teams during their kind of like development cycle, which is like while they are, while they're integrating in into chain security, we're not helping them test that out at that point in time. Once they have finished developing uh, their, their product and their ready to kind of like get in get onboarded that's when hyper comes in we do a bunch of simulation work with them we help them launch onto the replicated security testnet which is the main kind of interchain security testnet that we run public testnet it's got over 50 validators 
and um, it's where all the consumer chains are currently also uh, have their own test nets running. Um, and that's that's where we that's where we help. That's the portion that kind of hyper participates in. And so all right, great job. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I'm going to go over IBC routing. This is another more of a research and development thing. Um, but luckily, a lot of the research, uh, and I think some of the development even has already been done for us. Um, so uh, IBC routing is something that the hub was always supposed to do. <laughs> Um, you know, if you remember the white paper, uh, that was the role of the hub. That's why it's called the hub. Um, and um, so recently there's been, um, there's been um, basically like uh, some, some, uh, well, this is not even that recent, but, but in the past couple of years, there's been some research into how you can do IBC routing. Um, and there's been a very, I think a very interesting spec that's been produced by, uh, mostly spearheaded by the Polymer team. Um, and so this allows for IBC routing, um, which reduces like client update costs. Um, it allows for this IBC routing to happen without any packets being written to the intermediary chain, which is a big like unlock in terms of making it viable from a cost perspective. Um, so we want to, um, we want to pitch in where we can also just help coordinate and drive the process forward and kind of, you know, um, move things forward on getting, uh, the polymer routing into IBC go, um, and if there's more code that needs to be written, maybe help out a little bit on that, but just generally try to push it forward. Um, and then also on the business development front, um, we will, um, will, will uh, the interesting thing about it is that this IVC routing from Polymer also doesn't require any software on, special software on the intermediary chain. It's actually just an upgrade to IVC. And then you can use it with what, and use whatever chain you want as an intermediary chain, basically. So it doesn't have to be the hub, it could be any chain, right? But you have to trust the chains that are going through that have they have to trust the intermediary chain. So that's kind of the catch. And so it's almost more of a business development effort than a software development effort because you have to get these other chains to say, yeah, we'll we'll trust the hub uh, to route our packets. Um, and then the other thing with it is that <clears throat> um, it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, it doesn't really make a huge difference right now because the light client update costs are actually because of Honestly, volume is very low in Cosmos and everywhere in blockchain right now. Um, the gas costs are not very, very high. And so light client, making light client updates is not that big of a deal. Um, but once we have more volume, um, it's going to become a lot more um, of, of a pressing need. Um, I mean, I remember in like, you know, 2018 or whatever, you know, fees were extremely low on Ethereum. Um, and, you know, we were, I'm not getting attention here, but we were running, like I was on a project running high volume stuff on Ethereum because it was just so cheap. But basically, once the fees go up, it's going to become more pressing. And I think having the hub positioned kind of and ready to act as that routing hub, I think is going to be really healthy for the Cosmos hub and the ecosystem. Um, and it's not necessarily going to make a huge amount of money in fees for the hub. Because the whole point is to reduce fees. And it's very lightweight. But it just will help the hub live up to what it was always supposed to be. <laughs> and then also kind of cement its centrality and its important, importance to the Cosmos ecosystem. So, um, yeah. That's what we have on here now. I'll just say on the roadmap, um, we are, you know, we released it just, you know, like last week and stuff. Um, we're continuing to collect, um, collect feedback. Uh, we have been collecting feedback from a lot of people um, and we're going to continue to tweak it. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we have gotten is a lot of people are very excited about Atomic IBC, um, but also a lot of people aren't necessarily sure about it. Um, I think the consumer chains we work with, so right now Neutron is Stride, um, they aren't one hundred percent sure about it. Um, they're they're concerned that it's going to require, uh, you know, there could be resource contention between chains, or it's going to require these, you know, changes to ABCI plus plus to maybe not let them do things they want to do or whatever. Um, like I was addressing in science question, so um, we're probably going to kind of switch the road back to to being something a little bit more along the lines of like, here's the research and development section, and there we'll have the IBC routing and atomic IBC, and there's also some actually some interesting research that's come up around maybe often security, which, um, so and anyway, so, so we'll, we'll have it be a little bit more and have it be a little bit clearer about like that. These are research topics and it may be, maybe we figure out nobody wants to use atomic IBC because they all are using ABC plus plus and you just can't do it on atomic IBC or something. So it's like, you know, 
uh, we're, we're, we, we just can't, we can't be sure right now, um, but we're, we're going to keep on um, tweaking it. And uh, as, as things become clear from the research of what people want and what is technically possible, we'll be adjusting it. And also as we get feedback. So um, yeah. Yeah, uh, please, if you have feedback on the roadmap, we really need that. Uh, so put it in the chat, put it in the feedback form, or just say it out loud to our faces right now. Um, <laughs> that sort of accountability to the community is exactly what both of our teams need, especially as we make a push towards community pool funding, which would also increase our accountability to the hub community because those are the people that we want to work for. So we're also open for questions on that process especially as it relates to our roadmap, since the funding that we receive is for the purpose of supporting this roadmap that we're putting out there. So I, uh, I have one question. Um, in the IBC routing section of this document, um, I, I would like to just repeat back to you guys what I think it does and uh, just sort of get verification that I've got it right. So with this IBC routing feature, in addition to like the current way that transfers can pass through the hub, um, the hub would act as an aggregator of light client states. And this would then reduce the need for light client updates on both of the hub's counterparties. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So this is also, I have to just make this is distinct from the packet forward middleware. Um, uh, as it's used on the hub and also as it's been been, been put on chains like uh, Osmosis and Noble. And that actually does something completely different. It's also often called routing, but it's actually a completely technically different thing. Um, and that's a lot more about the uh, denominations that are on tokens in the in the token transfer um, stuff. But um, what this does is, is, is packets coming through this, they don't know that they've been routed. They have no clue. Uh, so if you, just to clear up the, 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 the difference, if if I send uh, one Juno to the Cosmos hub and then from the Cosmos hub to Osmosis, when it lands like through the token transfer right now, when it lands on Osmosis is actually, it's different. It's a distinct denomination from tokens that came direct from Juno to Osmosis, right? So the packet for middleware kind of both facilitates that, but can also, it can be sent back through to like unwind that denom difference and make them fungible again. So that's a completely different thing. Um, with this routing, um, the packet sent from Juno to Osmosis, even if the like the light client update had been routed over the hub, it would still be completely direct routed from Osmosis's perspective. Um, so, anyway, um, that out of the way, I think um, what what happens with IBC is that um, when you send a packet from one chain to another, there's something called a light client update, which happens before the packet is received. The relayer puts that through, and they pay gas on it. And what happens with a light client update is that the receiving chain verifies all the signatures from the validators of the sending chain on the update. And having verified the signatures, it then has uh, what's called a Merkle root hash. And that's basically this small piece of data that can be used to prove that anything was in the sending chain's database at the time the light client update was made. So basically, so that light client update goes through. Now the receiving chain has a full view of the sending chain at the time that the light client update went through. And then you say, hey, this packet was sent. And so to verify that packet, what happens is that the receiving chain uses that light client update to verify, was there actually funds sent you know, from the sending chain to the receiving chain by looking at the sending chain's database. And so those light client updates, um, <clears throat> they, uh, can be a, they can be a more, one of the more expensive types of transactions because they have to do um, a bunch of, um, they do have to do a bunch of signature verifications. And so that tends to be a little bit of heavier operation um, like I said, right now, with the gas fees being so low, it's not even that big of a deal. But if there's high volume, it is more expensive. And um, so what uh, what this what this uh, this multi hop routing does is it makes it so that um, let's say I I am I'm on a chain and I'm receiving packets from the hub. I'm receiving packets from osmosis and I'm receiving packets from Juno, too. And without multi hop routing. I would have to, to be able to receive any of those packets, a relayer would have to pay for the light client update to be processed from the hub, Juno, and Osmosis. Um, and so with the routing, what can happen is the relayer only pays for the hub update to be processed. And if the hub itself has already 
process the updates from Osmosis and Juno, then uh, it just looks at, it just trusts the hubs like client update to tell it what the updates were from the other two chains. Um, and so then the receiving chain has only, um, has only processed updates from, from, has processed an update from one chain from the hub. And for free, it got these other two chains in the bargain. So that's where the cost reduction comes from. Um, and the amount of costs that are reduced by that are also dependent on, you know, the level of interconnection between chains. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the idea there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So any other questions or, or feedback on the roadmap? Um, anyone have any opinions on Atomic IBC or how that would look? Uh, you know, I see, I think I saw Riley in here from Stride um, when we've talked to them already, but, uh, but yeah. Hey, uh, no, no additional comments from the Stride side. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess we can probably move on then. Um, I guess Isabel or, or, or Lexa, did you guys have anything in mind in, in terms of going over the, the the future funding prop or or, or anything? Oh wait, I, I have a question on the roadmap. What's the yes next steps? Because this is a proposed roadmap, and then how does it become the roadmap for the hub? That's a that's a good question. Um, I think. We are also, we have also on the side, it's, 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 it, we've been working on a process for uh, kind of a hub improvement proposals to kind of formalize the, pro like, sort of like Ethereum improvement proposals, or we even have our own interchain, what is it, interchain standards um, uh, for, you know, for more like IBC related stuff. Yeah. Um, so on the roadmap, I, that's an interesting question. Maybe we should have like a vote to ratify the roadmap. Um, I mean, we, um, I, I do have to, you know, I do have to say it's, it's like I said, it's, you know, it's open to, it's open to change. We're going to have to shift things uh, with input from the community. And as we also find technical facts from our research uh, and development. Um, but yeah, it, it makes, it probably does make sense to have some kind of ratification process on, on the roadmap as a whole. Right now we've been, you know, we have the feedback form open. We've also been going and asking people about it what they think about it and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I'm going to, like I said, uh, even like, you know, today or this week, I'm going to be tweaking it to kind of make things a little bit clearer around what's research and what's more of a guaranteed thing. Um, and I, I don't know, honestly, I think maybe we should have some kind of ratification process through um, through through governance for it. Um, but even well, after that, it, it will still change, obviously. Yeah. And I think that um, on Monday, we'll actually be posting the entire roadmap as well as the funding prop um, on the forum. So, you know, our kind of understanding is that if you have opinions about the roadmap or anything, then that's where you'll leave your feedback. We'll obviously keep having these calls to like, you know, discuss future features and, you know, the roadmap itself and the prop itself as well. Um, and then once, you know, if the prop passes, we consider that a ratification of the roadmap as well. And, and like Jahan said, just like we've been doing for the past, you know, quarter or so like we'll have these calls on an ongoing basis and just because it's in the roadmap doesn't mean that you know that's the only thing we're going to be doing or anything like that so yeah Lex anything to add uh I'm trying to find the line in the roadmap document that speaks to this because one of the things that we wanted to be careful of in developing this was that we weren't trying to make an omnibus this is the only thing that the hub is doing um, I think a key part of stewardship of the hub involves working with other teams and facilitating their ability to introduce features. Uh, and so this is, you know, less the only vision for the hub. Exactly. Thank you, Jahan. Yeah. Um, yeah. And more you know, jumping and, off point. And and also, the, yeah, to be clear, there's, there's two, there's two, there's two levels to this. The first level, of course, is that this is our roadmap. Uh, this is what we want to work on. Um, and we're not saying like, you know, we could have gone in and said, you know, like, I mean, um, like it's been done in the past. Um, yeah, there's going to be all this stuff. We're going to say, yeah, there's going to be, you know, there's people working on this stuff with like, uh, you know, the tokenomics or the inflation rate or, or there's like, uh, you know, stuff like where it's more of the, um, um, you know, the pro protocol and liquidity stuff. There's many, many different things that many people are working on for the hub. And we're not saying like, 
this is the hub's roadmap. This is the only thing that's going to happen because we, we don't even you know, know what people are working on right now. But um, on the, the, the other level is that, like I said, some of these things, and I'm going to make a clear distinction, I think, in this, in this document, um, based on some of the feedback, is like some of these things are research. Um, and so we want to be clear about like what's research uh, and what the what the potential paths are. And it's likely we may we may start out kind of focusing on atomic IBC, IBC routing and, um, you know, and maybe like often security or mesh security or something. And we may narrow down our focus um, as as we as we as we discover more and and, and go from there. So, yeah, just caveat. Cool. If uh, you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now or submit the feedback in the form that is in the agenda or drop them in the chat or, you know, we'll have a Twitter spaces tomorrow to go over similar things for like a wider audience. Um, so we welcome you to join us then as well as, um, you know, next Monday we'll be posting this on the forum. So please uh, feel free to share your um, comments and feedback. We We really want it. So think that's it if no one has any questions um actually i do have one question i saw isabel's comment here uh that <clears throat> questions on the prop itself are welcome and uh let me just say that it I, you know far as i'm concerned it's a really critical proposal because it's going to get both your teams like the the stamp of approval from the hub to do this work and uh <clears throat> excuse me i was just wondering if you guys could kind of run through um the pitch and everything uh and because i'd also be happy to comment and stuff like i think that mm, the hub is being transformed into something extremely competitive right now and so you know if we're just acting for the health of the hub, um, yeah, we want that to work out. Um, yeah, so we're going to be posting it on the forum on Monday, and we're kind of still, we've been going through review with, like, more private review with, with validators and stuff. Um, and, um, but I guess you can go over the over the high-level outlines of it um, on this call. Um, so the first aspect of we're requesting funding, uh, and this funding will replace the funding we have, our teams have been getting from the ICF. Um, and it's, uh, it's the, it's basically the same funding we've, we, we, you know, we've been getting for 2023, but we're asking for the community pool to provide that funding instead. Um, along with that, um, we have the roadmap, of course, that's important. Um, that's the, you know, the exact content here, um, basically. Um, and like I said, we're kind of doing, we're, we're continuing to do tweaks to it as we, as we gather more feedback. Um, and then another important aspect of it is actually uh, the oversight, um, oversight committee. And, um, so over, I think there's been, this has been a topic of, of kind of discussion, um, as it happens recently, um, Elijah from duality made a, made a post that a lot of people liked on uh, the forum about it. Um, and there's kind of been a lot of, a lot of discussion, at least from my perspective, a lot of, you know, the, a lot of the big decisions, whether you have a global oversight committee that like runs everything, or you have it more, a little bit closer to what has been happening with community pool funding, where you have more, if there's oversight, it's kind of on a per proposal basis. And so in this proposal, we are going on the per proposal basis. We think it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit too much to swallow probably. Like it, it's very, it's like having, I don't even know if I would be in support of having some committee, which is just oversight for the whole hub. I don't, you know, I don't know if anybody is really, um, has the authority to do that, honestly. Um, but for our proposal with, with the committee, what we'll be doing is, um, we have a few validators, um, large and, and small. Um, we also have some representatives from consumer chains. Um, and then also we, we have a few people that are from around the ecosystem uh, who we think will, you know, have be, be able to provide a lot of feedback and then also kind of, you know, have various skills or, you know, are generally, you know, are good, are good builders themselves. Um, and this committee, it's just a, it's, it's, un, it's unpaid. Um, but we're also being very explicit about, about the amount of work they have to do um, to avoid it being like a thing where, you know, they're not getting paid, so slacking off. So what they do is there will be five meetings throughout 2024, one kickoff meeting, 
about the, the roadmap and, and where it's at at that point, and then uh, a meeting after every quarter. Um, and during those quarterly meetings, we're going to be presenting a, a report um, and that will have, uh, I'm still working on like the format. We're gonna provide uh, you know, a, a, a format of it with the props so you can see what we'll be reporting on. We'll provide a report basically on the major, the major topics. So it's gonna be like, you know, work completed, work planned, um, operational, you know, operational smoothness, any operational challenges that were encountered, you know, stuff like emergency upgrades, things like that. Um, and then we're also going to be having the committee basically give us a, a kind of a grade on each of those aspects of the report. And then also ask any questions um, that they want to ask. And based on, um, so during that meeting, we'll have minutes and, um, and we'll be, we'll condense those into like summary um, or maybe even in videos um, of the meeting. And based on that, um, that that's kind of, that will give the community a way to see like what we've been doing um, and kind of like a, a one point where they can have like an overview, you know, periodically of, of the work we're doing. Um, so that's that's kind of the information flow there. Uh, on, on the power of the committee, the committee is um, due to kind of the way that the, um, well, so, oh yeah, first of all, actually the most important thing I forgot to say was that the way the funding will be dispersed is that it's gonna be an investment account and it's going to be vesting over 2024. So the funding we get is gonna be released slowly throughout the year. Um, so that means that if any point during 24, 2024, um, you know, we're not doing a good job or whatever, um, you know, there can be a signal proposal to basically claw back that funding. And um, the committee is gonna be a key part of that. The committee doesn't have to authorize the clawback at all. The community can say the committee sucks too, and we're just gonna end the whole thing if they want at any time. Um, but the committee will also be like, if the committee really feels there's a lot of doubts, if they introduce that single proposal, then it's like very likely to pass. Um, and, you know, we could also do something like where we, we wanted to do something where the committee would actually have signing, a signing authority to kind of like um, have to sign a multi-sig to like claw back the funding themselves without a proposal. Um, that's not really possible right now with the current Cosmos SDK. It, might be on Dowdow and stuff like that, or maybe even best CK50, but we didn't want to kind of get into having a bunch of technical prerequisites on a proposal. And we also think that if, you know, if if the committee says like the funding should be clawed back uh, in, you know, publicly or in a signaling proposal, I think that's going to be like pretty, a pretty strong signal to the community. Like, you know, like that can even be something, maybe we should make that more explicit in the prop. Like that can be something really where it's like, you know, it's, it's, the, the committee has has said this is you know end this and it's going to be like then then you just vote for that as a matter of course because that's just the rules um and um yeah and then even if one committee let's say one committee member feels like things are going badly the rest of them don't um you know that that committee member can still speak up and make a signal proposal, signaling proposal themselves and they could say maybe yeah like i'm blowing the whistle you know the work's not getting done even though everyone else in the committee you know are are, are, are not, I'm, I'm still going to say, you know, it should be clawed back and then the community can vote on that. Or, you know, like I said earlier, a community member even with, without anybody on the committee can make that proposal and, and, and have it be, have it be deliberated on. So that's kind of the, the model of the accountability and, and, and trust um, that, that we're, we're looking at. Um, I have some chat questions here. Um, yeah, oh yeah, and Lex has linked in, in the chat there. There's the uh, she she posted kind of a the this committee structure as more of like not specific to our prop, but as more of a theoretical um, construct in her forum post. So yeah, any any questions about that or any comments? Um, no further questions, and I, I do have one comment, and I I'm not sure that we should do it on a recorded call. There's like a thing. And if we could schedule a time to discuss the thing, um, that'd be cool. Uh, sorry, it, it is a uh, or a potential issue. Please, no security issues on this call. Yeah, exactly. I don't. Yeah, I don't think it makes sense to do that here. Okay. Yeah, Johan, maybe you can um, reach out to Jacob and try to schedule some time. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that right now. Actually, text them Slack. All right, cool. Um, I think that's that's it from from me. Then, um, I guess is there anything else we wanted to cover? We're at the end at the hour here. 
Yep. Perfect timing. Um, thank you everyone for joining. And um, we really appreciate everyone who's here today and, you know, everyone who always joins us. So um, keep an eye out for more comms and we will see you in the internet somewhere. <laughs> cool. Thanks everybody. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Lipit. Bye.